Okay, good morning everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. It, it really is genuinely lovely to see you all here. I think it's a great opportunity to have outside eyes come and uh, look at what we're doing and um, help us on our journey. Uh, today I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about our context, a little bit about our learning from uh, the last time you visited us, which was about what, 20 months ago, I think. Um, our approach to existing challenges um, and then tell you a little bit, of, I think, about what, what has become over the past three or four years a really core philosophy in this organization. So our footprint uh, depends how you, what, what service you talk about, but we're, we're spread across something like 30 sites. Um, what we call our home patch is um, Liverpool, Sefton, Knowsley, bits of St. Helens and Lancashire. Um, and of course, we provide uh, high secure services <coughs> to um, the North West, the West Midlands, and the whole of Wales. So sometimes when you talk about the trust, it depends what sort of emphasis uh, you're putting on it. But when you look at that sort of spread of geography and so on, it's one of the reasons why we have three clinical divisions inside the organization. One that's local and responds principally to uh, the Sefton uh, and Liverpool uh, boroughs. Um, a specialist learning disability division, which provide services uh, across parts of the north of England, but is principally based in Lancashire at the Wally site, um, and our secure division, which is our high, medium, and low secure services. Um, lots of things about nursing care. We could, we, we could talk a lot here, um, but we're 5,000 staff members. We will, in June, acquire uh, South Sefton um, Community Services. That will uh, push us up to about 5,000 members of staff. Um, lots of interesting things. The, the only one I'd point out is, is actually we have about 500 volunteers in the organization, about 60% of whom are service users or carers. That was a very deliberate decision on behalf of the Trust Board. Um, we thought that we wanted to bring the outside world into the organization, not to just have contact with service users and carers in a, a sort of organized or choreographed way, but to have those people in our services every day, working with us uh, in that side-by-side -side, uh, notion. Um, those home home boroughs that we, we uh, referred to earlier have some of the highest social deprivation indices, um, certainly in the country, actually in the west of Europe, as it turns out. So it's no surprise then that we see the impacts of deprivation um, really uh, uh, writ large in, in the demand for our services. So we're a very busy organization. Like most mental health trusts, we're getting to be a busier organization every year. So we're seeing about a 5% rise in referrals to the trust every year. And again, I think like most mental health trusts, if you look at our finances, you can see that that is going to be simply one of the biggest challenges uh, this trust, like many acute mental health trusts, will face as we go ahead. So uh, this is Liverpool CCG specifically. The growth in mental health funding uh, for the CCG, um, our growth, the trust's growth, which is tantamount to a flat line, so no growth. And if you look at the red line or the orange line below, it shows you the net investment after the trust has met its cost improvement programs. So we're an organization that is getting busier with less resource to, to manage that. And we could have a great big, um, isn't it terrible, the way things are, approach to this. Or I think um, our preferred approach is to think about this as a, a sort of opportunity, a recognition that the present business model that the NHS engages in, which is do more faster, as quickly as possible, pilot higher, is probably not something that's actually sustainable. That's not good for patients, it's not good for staff. Um, and if you look at our colleagues in the acute trust who are in, in acute care, who tend to be specialists at that, you can see that that starts to grind to a, a progressive halt over time. So this reflects our sort of core philosophy, our strategy for, for handling those key challenges. And this is something that the board talks about all the time. It was maybe one of the very first conversations we had, uh, certainly when I joined the trust, which is um, quality without efficiency is just unsustainable. So we have to be in the business of changing our business model. Uh, and equally, efficiency without quality is unthinkable. 
So we will never, as a board, have a conversation that says it's more important to be efficient than safe, for example. Um, and that's, um, you might say that's fine rhetoric, but we bring that to life um, on our strategic wheel here. You'll, uh, I think you will see that wheel pretty much everywhere you go. And while people may explain it to you in different ways, it's broadly, broadly recognized through the organization. Um, and right in the middle, we have the, the notion of private, striving for perfect care and a just culture. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a while. Um, but I think it's important to say a little bit about, about how we um, are approaching the challenges uh, of the environment we work in. The first is we focus very hard on having foresight. So how do we get ourselves ahead of where we currently are? It's incredibly easy to get sucked into everything uh, that is, is everyday business. And we talk about this in, in terms of, for example, our zero suicide and our zero restraint approaches. I'll talk about those in more detail in a minute. Those aren't sound checks, those aren't sound, sound bites. Those are very real things in this organization. Um, I'll talk about insight, um, listening to understand, not just listening to react. I think that's probably one of the big changes we've really made. And then oversight. Um, and by oversight, we don't mean traditional performance management. Uh, we mean um, openness, transparency, and candor in everything we do. You add those things up, we think you add up to a learning organization. So perfect care um, for us is, is um, just culture is characterized with a, an improving physical health, big, hairy, audacious goal, a no force first, hairy, audacious goal, zero suicide as a hairy, audacious goal and then setting this in a fair and just culture. So these are really about, um, in the end, giving our staff permission, encouraging our staff to think well beyond targets, to think well beyond achieving minimum, minimums, to actually uh, create an environment where it's absolutely right to drive at doing things completely differently. And I'll talk about some examples of that. But, um, if we're going to be a learning organization, and we focus very hard on that, I think it's really important we talk a little bit about the last inspection and learning from that inspection. There were some things that were, were of immediate concern during the last inspection. I've listed them here. I'm sure you've done your homework and, and you know what they were. But we, sometimes the next day, but certainly during the course of that actual week, um, were able to resolve quite a lot of these issues very, very rapidly. Um, support given, changes made, and monitoring ongoing, so we haven't stopped looking at lots of these issues. We've used them indeed as sort of springboards to make us think about other things. But then there were a couple of issues that I think I categorized them in the real big ticket items. So psychology across the trust was a big ticket item, and this was a wide issue, psychology services right across the trust. Something that actually we were aware of when CPC came, but we just hadn't moved on quickly enough with it. So it was, it was great actually to have CQC highlighted for us because it was a real impetus. What have we done? We've invested money. We've recruited 19 new psychologists across the service. But probably more important than that, we've been developing the psychological skills of the whole workforce. We have a very clear approach now that, that is about equity in an inpatient and community setting based on need. So we're using our psychology very differently. Um, and since we started doing this, um, uh, the psychologists have been in post. We've seen a 30% increase in clinical activity. And I have to say, the morale now within our, our psychology services is absolutely excellent. And for the first time in many years, and I mean over a decade, uh, the trust is now a net importer of psychologists. Uh, rather than a net exporter. So we were losing people hand over fist. We're now attracting them hand over fist. And I'm really pleased that in this story, which was difficult at the time, um, we focused very hard. And um, and it's great that somebody told me the other day we, we've been asked to come to one of the national you know, gym bigs and talk about the story of change in psychology. That's brilliant. But it's also made us think, you know, it won't just be psychology. And I'm pleased to say, uh, as we've, we've acquired Calderstones last year. So allied health professionals is another issue that we, in the same way now, have been taking a really big ticket across the system look 
at AHPs and certainly for part of the service we'll have the first bit of that review done uh, by the end of March. Another big ticket item, this one was was very deep, um, was the position we found ourselves in with one of our older patients was. Um, uh, and this was, I mean, I think we all still feel uh, modified by, um, by the fact that this happened. Um, and we've been around this just on a regular and constant basis. Not just this ward, but, but uh, thinking about our general philosophy around what we're doing on our wards. Definitely, in this instance, new leadership, support and scrutiny. The stuff that you would expect to happen. But more broadly, a focus on leadership across the trust. More broadly, a focus about making sure we've got the right people doing these jobs. Um, increased staffing levels and investment. Um, but consistent with the way we're doing so many things now, to co-produce the changes that we need to see take place on our ward with carers, families, and the broader community of people, um, so that we understand absolutely the impact uh, we're making. Um, I think probably um, you'll hear, some of you will hear about the surveillance system we use in the Trust, which we just put in place at the time of the last CQC visit. And we were, one of the things we did after the Airwell Ward was to say, well, how come our surveillance system didn't really see that? And the, the answer is, it did see it, but, but it wasn't lighting up in the right way. We, we weren't sensitive enough to the information that we were, we were picking up. So, so one of the things we did was really take the learning out of that, made a wholesale review of, of what we do in Sudan. So I think it's much better now across the organization um, for what was not um, a, a, a great, a great uh, situation we found ourselves in. Um, we also refreshed a lot of our safer staffing thinking as a result of what happened in Airwell. So it wasn't just for us about fixing the immediacy of Airwell, but it was about extracting as much as we could out of the wider learning. And then a third big ticket item uh, for Calderstones. So this trust, um, largest single learning disability site in Britain for forensic clients, um, was um, was called Calderstones when the CQC last visited. July 1st of last year, we acquired Calderstones, so Calderstones no longer exists as an entity. Um, so for us, it is a specialist learning disability uh, division. Um, but um, this is an interesting story, and it happened in an interesting way. And there was a huge amount, as you may know, of, of kerfuffle around the transforming care agenda, which actually we strongly believe in as a, as a board. One of the reasons we wanted to be involved with the acquisition of Calderstones was, first of all, we thought we could bring something to that organization, but also we fundamentally feel that, um, that a different deal for people with an LD is absolutely right. Um, and I think you'll see and feel some of the change that, that we've been making there. But, but since the acquisition, we've had the best patient experience scores uh, ever in Calderstones. High level of family and carer satisfaction and involvement. 48% reduction in incidents since the last CPC visit. Uh, restrictive practice, 44% reduction since. And we have used the Southern Health opportunity, I suppose, to work with Mazars to make sure that we have a leading edge view in developing a, an approach to deaths and LD services. So what I'm trying to get across, I guess, is this, is, this has been a, a, a big undertaking for the Trust. It's, it's still a massive challenge for us. So next week, NHS England will report on its consultation about the full closure of, of the services on that site or the partial closure of services on that site. But either way, it's a complicated thing for us to have to deal with. But I just wanted to talk about it in, I think, what are very positive terms, because we set out to make sure, principally, that we had a safe landing with the acquisition of Calderstone. And this was in the midst of some very, very deep criticism of the services, public criticism of the services at that site. And I actually think we've, we've pushed ahead remarkably um, in the time we've been up there, but it would be wrong to pretend that um, it is without risk. 
there is a massive risk as we think about um, the new clinical model. You know, one of the big risks is we're seeing very slowly the development of true and frank uh, services in uh, communities for patients to move to, so CTR patients to move on to. That's incredibly slow. And it's a cause of concern for us that patients have been taken from actually quite safe, supportive, positive environments to be put in facilities on their own where I think the care isn't necessarily as good as it could be. But that aside, that's in a sense a commissioner issue, but we challenge hard on that. We've worked very hard to create um, a new future for many of the staff at Calder Stones. The critical bit will be um, learning disability forensic transition teams. So using lots of the expertise we currently have in the staff at Calder Stones, but moving a great deal of that out into a community LD setting. So I think that's again something that we've talked a lot about to staff there. Thoroughly engaged process, but you know that is nonetheless still a significant risk as we go ahead. So I want to spend a little bit of time now shifting back into why we think we've changed gear around some issues in the organisation. We talk a lot about perfect care and I expect sometimes people to understand that and actually oftentimes they don't. So permit me to do the exercise we normally do around this. Does it, you know that's the Mersey Ferry? Yeah? It's topical for the part of the world. You're a few miles off, but if it rains, you know, you could uh, well be on a ferry down the river. Um, if any of you, in the time you get to have some free time on a CQC visit, <laughs> um, uh, we're going to get on the ferry across the Mersey. Put your hand up if you think you've got a reasonable expectation that you're going to get to the other side. So pretty much everybody in the room has a view that you would get. To so we, we do have expectations of perfection in reality. We've got them all the time in our own lives. We don't always have them around healthcare, but we do have them in our lives. Now, if 0.1% of the time the ferry uh, was imperfect and sank, that means it would probably sink about once a month. So that's 0.1%. So if it was uh, 1%, it would be sinking on a very regular basis, at least weekly. How many of you would be keen to take a trip on the Mersey Ferry if on average it sank once a week? So you're also really good at risk adjustments. Yeah? And in essence, that's what the business of perfect care is about. First of all, expectation that it's not unreasonable to have a different way to think around healthcare. And it is really, really reasonable to think about risk and the management of risk in a way where we tackle it very early on and don't spend forever extracting the learning from things. And actually, even if there is an inherent uh, error rate, then we do something about changing that error rate as we go. That's, that's why we think perfect care is not a, a, an abstract thing, but it's something that really will fundamentally drive the change nature of what we do in the organization. It's not fluffy stuff. Most of what we do in perfect care is down here. It's getting the basics right every time. You can't ever move away from that. You've got to get the basics right every time. But in doing that, you've also got to have a medium-term uh, medium uh, view. In this instance, reducing variation, complexity, waste, all of those types of things. And you also have to spend some time innovating. You can't spend all your time innovating. The pyramid would be the wrong way around them. But you've got to have these things in the right sort of order. And for us, perfect care is about making sure that we ask enough of the questions and use enough of our time against this particular structure. I'll show you some examples. So zero suicide, we do a huge amount down here about making sure we get absolutely get the basics right. In the middle, we've got a longer term ambition, but it's medium term, to make sure that we get safety plans, our psychological awareness, competency-based approaches. And in the top end, we have a, a relationship with Stanford Risk Authority in California, um, and we've just formed a company with them to develop um, two types of app that will use natural language processing to allow us to think about the sorts of stuff that patients are saying in their notes. They may not be saying, I'm suicidal. They may be saying lots of things. 
but that those apps will allow us, including looking into social media with permission, um, to really think about um, every day in this organisation, we calculate on the risk associated with somebody's presentation around suicide. You can do that to your heart's content if you don't get this stuff and this stuff right, but you also have to do that. So Perfect Care for Us is about structuring stuff from the really practical through to the innovative. Similarly with No Force First. Don't know where I'm going. So I think, um, yeah. So, so the, 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 this is just an example, uh, a clip, GIF, I think it calls, um, of all of the things that go on in the organization. Um, so there's a couple of hundred change programs going on across the organization every year. And these are both about fulfilling the getting the basics right, the bottom of the triangle stuff, and pushing the organization into and giving people the freedom to do the sorts of things that they absolutely need to do to make sure that we move beyond doing the basics. And I think this is the critical part uh, for us, is in changing our business model, you know, we've been able to give um, PDSA training, design thinking, all sorts of approaches to our staff, but give them the tools to do these things. And it's just important to know that, that those tools exist and they're there. Can I have the next one, please? But um, the thing that I did want to talk about for the next two or three minutes just, and then maybe almost done, is um, bringing our values to life. So we've talked about the perfect care idea. Um, four years ago, we established four values in the organization, and we thought hard about how do we make sure that those aren't posters stuck to the walls, you know, because we've probably all been there, you know. How do we bring those things to life? So. Continuous improvement and enthusiasm has all been about perfect care. I think that's living those things every day. And that little diet, that the, the little gif was really about um, describing our enthusiasm and approach to continuous improvement. But like many improvement approaches, you often hit a ceiling, you get so far, and then there's an awful lot of literature that shows that things stop. Things stop because often in your improvement programs you've gone for the obvious things, the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that you know you can absolutely do and achieve. But the really big changes, the changes that really are going to have fewer lives lost because of suicide, are going to have fewer patients suffering restrictive practices and so on. Those things, the really hard yards, are the things that you need to absolutely get in to, to make the change. And Actually, since the CQC came last time, we started a conversation with our staff. We've now called it a just culture, or a fair and just culture. But we've talked to over 400 senior staff in the organization about what stops the next step, what stops us breaking through the ceiling. And actually, um, it's the same as all the research shows. People are frightened to take the next step because they think with that comes the finger of blame. Often that's perception. I don't think we are a blaming organization, but often it's perception. But perception is a powerful reality in this respect. So just culture for us is about accountability and actually respect. The single biggest driver we think of all of this is respect. And we think these two things together really do allow us to move to being a learning organization. Are we there? Well, no, we're not there. And what do we know about not being there? Well, the answer is probably you never get there. The day you declare yourself a learning organization, you've believed your own sort of BS too much, if I can put it that way. Yeah? This is never ending. This goes on forever and ever and ever. But I think you do have to meet these conditions to be able to get there. So for us, a just culture is a shorthand way is up at the top in, in, in the dark lettering. First ask why and how, not who. How many of us have been in, in investigations where the first question is, who's involved? You know, it's very, very common, very common. And it puts the shutters up instantly. It stops the learning process dead in its tracks. So our philosophy is to discover how to ask how and why and not who. And pretty simply, 
bringing out information that should be improved to levels or groups that can do something about it. So not investigations that take place somewhere else and the reports given, but a learning exercise that actually works with the people involved. This is really important. It allows the organization to invest resources in improvement that have a safety dividend rather than re deflecting resources into legal protection. So we spend money defending ourselves rather than doing the right thing. And it's not an accident now over the past few years that we've got one of the lowest levels of NHS litigation authority exposure of any mental health trust in the country. Because we've been working very, very hard to get the risk early on, early on work with the people involved, and not let it escalate to litigation. So simultaneously, it's about satisfying the need to calibrate accountability with learning and improvement. Is that just um, more guff? Or is it something that's absolutely real? Well, we think it's real. Here's some staffing issue, issues from, this is our secure division. We've looked at live disciplinary cases and employees suspended. <clears throat> this is 2016. If you run it out to 2015, and I think if you run it out as far as we've ever collected information, what you see is um, a fairly constant number of disciplinaries and a fairly constant number of suspensions. And in the year that we've been doing, year and a half, we've been doing the Just Culture investigation stuff, or the Just Culture approach, you can see the collapse in live disciplinaries and employees suspended. That's not a reduction or a collapse in accountability. There's actually much more accountability in our services now. There are real conversations about managing risk in a very different way. So for me, this is an indication that Just Culture really does deliver the change that will turn into the freedoms, that will give our staff, you know, everything they need to go ahead and push on those big, hairy, audacious goals. Uh, lastly, this bit about side-by-side -side versus face-to-face. -face -to -face. Um, I think in the work we've done around Perfect Care, we've discovered that there are two types, probably at least two types of engagement. One is a face-to-face -face engagement, which if you want to know something, if you want to have a response, face-to-face -face is fine. So we can do a face-to-face. But you can't tell me the colour of the curtains behind you. Yeah, I actually don't know other than the screen what's there. Yeah, we're having a dialogue, we're engaging. Now, I think if we stand side by side, we've got a very clear view. Well, you don't have to stand. That wasn't an instruction, by the way. I want to see the curtains. Yeah, yeah. But actually, we get the same view of life. And, and fundamentally, that's something that... And that's, that's about engaging to understand, not engaging to respond. And that's become a core philosophy in the organization now. The progress we have made around um, uh, uh, suicidal thinking, the progress we have made around No Force First, is fundamentally and completely and totally embedded in a co-production philosophy that says side by side. And I'm happy for you to test that, uh, uh, of course, as you go. The Life Rooms is one example of this. Um, you might call it a recovery college. We think it's a recovery college plus, 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 plus. But it's about changing our response to what patients want. They don't want an adult-child relationship when we send them uh, appointments for care that they probably don't want or don't want to read. It's, a, it's an adult relationship that values um, recovery. It values side-by-side. -side, and it's all about co-production of, of what people want. So for us, side-by-side um, -side is real. Um, our volunteers is very, very deliberate. Very deliberate indeed. It's a different way to think about bringing the community right in through your front door, and having it work with you side by side as a co-participant rather than big engagement sessions, which we've all sat through and have their use and have their value and have their meaning, but this is something very different. We have peer support workers with lived experiences right in our services. One of them you'll hear, Iris Benson, an incredibly complex person, but Iris now is our lead, employed by the Trust full time. We had to struggle and fight the DWP to get it to happen, but we bloody well did it. So that we could have somebody who is not just a symbol, but a, a, a powerhouse for this sort of change in the organization. And finally, duty of candor, something that with our zero suicide work, we've taken really seriously. Um, I, I've been to families who've lost their sons or daughters in our services through suicide. And 
that for me is the maximum expression of the duty of candor in this organization. I think they should be safe when they're in our services. I think we shouldn't be bringing somebody up to say something awful has happened. And I feel my accountability really, really profoundly as a result of that. And it's a remarkable thing then, a few weeks later, to have people say, well, can we come in and work with you and change your systems and processes and your services? Because their power to do that with our staff is far greater than my positional power will ever give me to do that. So I'm going to finish on, on three stories that are only about 30 seconds each. I used to do a lot of environmental damage to the ward. I used to boot doors and I never hit a staff since I've been here. I always say I do, but I've never done it um, because I don't want to see myself as a violent person. Basically, I got arrested for street robbery and ABH, which was against students. So obviously I got, I was in court, I got sent down for it. Um, but I got, basically, I'm on a, a life sentence, um, which is an IPP, Indeterminate Public Protection Sentence. When I was in court, I, I, I just used to joke with a judge before I got sent down, and I said, whatever sentence you give me, I can do it sat on the toilet. So he was going through the sentences, and uh, he said, right, two years, do 12 months. I went, do that sat on the back. Right, three years, do 18 months. Do that sat on the back. I went, all right, then, smart ass. Um, Two years, six month IPP, looked at G4S woman, said, What the heck's that? So, when Stephen, a life sentence, but with parole, and I collapsed. And I arrived in a taxi, um, double handcuffed, um, and then when I got to the MSU through the airlock, um, they said, Oh, it's all right, officers, you can take his handcuffs off now. It's like, No, not until it gets to the ward. And they went, Well, it's secure now, so. They took him off and I went freely to the ward and it's a good organisation. The staff here do a fantastic job. They work on the wards. It'd be nice to have the staff who work here already to stay here and give service users a chance, like myself, to come back and say, I'm proud of this service. I've not got one bone in my body that I'll say it's bad. Slowly, Ashley began to recover. Drugs, intensive support and personalised care all helped. But the attitude of staff was the most important. <laughs> to see Ashley when he first got admitted and, and the crisis that he was in and to sit there and have a laugh with him today and talk to him and see him playing pool and stuff like that, that's, like a, that's just a brilliant feeling. What do they do to make you trust them? Treat me like a human being which wasn't done before in, in the other systems. I've gone through the gate as a patient in a secure vehicle in handcuffs, and I've um, gone through one now where I say hello to people as though they're friends. What's up? To think of where I was more than years ago, you know, just, I've come out of the hotel, I built a little mountain on top of it, and I'm standing on top waving down at everyone. Iris Benson now an MBE for her work in this field. She actually is a former patient here, but continues to get treatments which are ongoing for her issues, even as she was speaking to me. It's caused me to hear voices all the time, so that's all day and all night, and they're quite intrusive at the moment. Yeah. So I'm really having to concentrate hard. I see and uh, hear and smell things that no one else can through my childhood experiences so I could wander off at any time. So it is difficult and I'm difficult to manage but the nurses that have looked after me over the years have managed really well and because of the new things that go on now it's very different. I haven't been in hospital for about 16 months when I was that typical revolving door patient because of the new services and the way we work with people now. So I'm very fortunate and without the staff that have nursed me over the years the bottom line is I wouldn't be here talking to you and they've done that for so many others as well. So I think that just, um, the three stories are of course what drives us every day. Um, Iris is our, our lead employee now for um, co-production. Um, 
this isn't just for us a set of philosophies. These are a set of practices. That's the critical thing. Um, I think maybe the, the first time CPC came here, we were in the, the, the early phases of this. We were discussing it philosophically. Um, you know, so No Force First isn't a pilot in the organization. It's live across the organization. It's up and down like a, a, a thing that goes up and down. You know, Of course it is. I was going to say something rude there, but I thought um, I'd better not. Um, and those are the challenges. Those are the real, live, everyday challenges of doing this sort of stuff. And we've got loads of them still. But we've got bags and bags and bags of enthusiasm and energy to make sure that we push beyond those um, those challenges. So thanks very much. We honestly really look forward to your feedback this week.